what we'll do is I will go ahead and just introduce our mm -hmm. edit board. And then I'm going to give, um, I'll give Francis a chance to do the opening remarks first. And then let Mark. You, let me ask you a question. Sure. I hate to say this. Francis is always happy to do the first opening. Oh, and okay. I'm willing to do that for her. <laughs> Not a problem whatsoever. So, well, Francis, it's what? Up to, it's up to you, uh, Francis. What do you think? I was going by who entered the room first. So oh. Usually, it's the incumbent, but we don't have an incumbent. Right. So, um, and and my name, my last names. I'll go ahead, and I'll just we'll stay on course, Mark. I'll go okay. ahead. And okay. 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 I appreciate that <laughs> offer. <though. laughs> I'll take you up on it another time. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. You, okay. You can you can tell Cecilia we 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 get along. We've got a nice thing going, so it's it's nice that it's refreshing actually. Yes, that is good. That is really nice. So it's almost time, it's almost time for closing remarks. <laughs> <laughs> so so um anyway, I'm Cecilia Rexis and I'm the editorial writer for the Tri City Herald. And then we have um, joining us, Martin Valadez. He is a community rep. We have Lori Lancaster. She is also a community rep. And we have Jack Briggs. He is the retired publisher of the Tri-City Herald. And we have Ken Robertson. He is the retired executive editor of the Tri-City Herald. So, um, so I guess we're ready to roll. Go ahead, Francis, you can give us an opening and Mark, you can give us an opening and then, um, I'm gonna time it. I'll give you about two minutes and uh, I'll cut you off if it gets a little long. So <laughs> so whenever you're ready, Francis. Thank you, Cecilia. And to the other members of the Tri-City Herald editorial board and community members. My name is Francis Quattle. I am a candidate for position one from the 16th Legislative District. I was born in Walla Walla. I was raised on an irrigated farm in Tushi, and I went on to graduate from WSU with a degree in nursing. I've been a registered nurse for 37 years. And now I've been asked, can a nurse be an effective legislator? Yes, that's my answer. I have spent most of my professional career Assessing a problem, making a plan, and recalibrating that plan when needed so that the best outcome for the patient is made. Nurses often work in teams which require skill in communication and collaboration, but sometimes they work alone during a night shift. I've done all that. And I believe that that is a good skill set to bring to Olympia. Representatives must be able to solve difficult problems and make decisions, but also know how to care for people. I will listen to you, I will work through an issue, and I will work with anyone to make things better for the people here in the 16th district. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Are you ready for me now? I am. Go for okay, it. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Francis and and uh, Cecilia and and the rest of you. Um, it, it's a an honor, a privilege to be able to to visit with the Tri City Herald. My name is Mark Quicker, and I am also running for the uh, 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 position of State House Representative, 16th District, Position One. Uh, I come from a, a, a four, I'm a fourth generation farmer. Uh, come from uh, a family that has been in the Wawa Valley since the 1800s, uh, both sides of the family. Uh, I've uh, been raised on the farm, but I've also uh, had the opportunity to uh, start my own businesses and also work as an employee for a, a large farm organization. Uh, I uh, worked for the Washington Farm Bureau for over 17 years. One of those years, I, was the, I managed the legal foundation for the Farm Bureau, uh, the other years, I was a regional field director. I worked with Farm Bureau leaders uh, throughout the state of Washington, provided training programs, and uh, uh, helped them with policy development and testifying within hearings. Spent a lot of time in Olympia working with legislators and other leaders throughout the industry. 
And I also work uh, in, in training uh, leaders to work with uh, members of Congress uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I, I have a lot of vast experience. I have over uh, 30 years and, and 20 plus committees uh, from everything from being uh, uh, working on uh, forest management uh, to um, advisor committees uh, within the watch uh, the Walla Walla Union Bulletin, uh, Fort Walla Walla, uh, uh, Christian, uh, uh, the um, uh, Jubilee Christian Academy, uh, and then um, uh, some stewardship groups. So I have a lot of of experience. I can come to, to Olympia, go to Olympia with that knowledge uh, and, and, uh, and make a difference working across the aisle because I've done that with programs that I developed uh, within the Washington Farm Bureau. <laughs> Your time's up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's okay. That's great. That's great. So um, I guess I'll start with a question. Um, Mark, I'll let you go. I'll let you answer this one first, and then I'll let Francis answer. What What separates you from your opponent, Mark? What separates you the uh, most from Francis? I think for me, I, I, I believe I'm, I'm uh, very well diversified. Um, I, I'm a businessman. Uh, I've been an employee. Uh, I've employed uh, hundreds of people, so I understand uh, what the needs of the employers are and the needs of employees. At the same time, I'm very well versed uh, within the industry, understanding all of agriculture, uh, diversified crops, and then also understanding how business works and what we're up against against regulation, of what we're up against in in uh, uh, new taxes and the increase in taxes and how it affects us because I am an employer and I deal with that every single day. So for me, uh, that's that's uh, what what I believe I can bring to the table. What about you, Francis? What do you think separates you from from Mark? Thank you, Cecilia. I appreciate Mark's contribution to the community, both himself and his family. I have, been a, I have been part of this community 49 of my 59 years. The 10 years that I spent right after graduating from college, I worked in three different healthcare systems across the country. I worked in very large urban centers, one in Baltimore and a medium-sized medical center in Boise. And then I was back in Seattle at the University of Washington prior to returning back to Walla Walla in 1993. I believe that experience has given me a broader aperture in how I view the world and how I view the, the macro issues and the micro issues. I believe that there one size does not fit all in terms of solving a problem. I am at 59 years old and as a woman, a nurse, a mother, and a stepmother, I'm, I'm exceedingly practical. And I am humble enough to understand that I don't know all the answers, but I am persistent enough to find the answers. You have to be when you're a nurse and you're caring for people by yourself at two o'clock in the morning. And when you're in clinical leadership, which I have been for 22 years at Providence St. Mary's, I managed the surgical service line, which is everything before and after the operating room. And I have attended to, I have attended to thousands of regulations and I have, I have managed uh, hundreds of people and multi-million dollar budgets, both operational capital and remodel budgets. Hey. I understand. I understand how to bring a team together to find a common, uh, to meet a common need, and I appreciate incremental improvement to reach a goal. Great. Is there anybody who wants to jump in from the board? Martin or Jack or Ken? I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to hear where both of you might agree. One of you is coming from the right wing, the others coming from the left wing. Do you have any areas of common agreement? Well, I, I think we probably do. Francis comes from, and I, <laughs> I'm speaking for Francis, but Francis comes from a farm family. And so she grew up on a farm. And I think that that is, is helpful for her in, in uh, 
and agro culture, and that makes a difference. And then on on my end of it, um, I I understand uh, what we're up against with with health insurance and and the personal protection equipment and the things that we need to do, especially in the healthcare industry, uh, primarily because of the employees that we have. We have to keep everybody safe. I I don't think we disagree on that. Um, we're we're fortunate that we have a, a, a pretty much a, a nice relationship in that. In that but what do you agree on? Well, I think that's what I just I said when it came to some of the issues on, on agriculture. I think we both uh, agree on that. I, I think I would we would agree that we ne need and, I, and I'm not trying to speak for Francis, but I heard her mention that we don't need to have the continued regulation that we're seeing now. Okay, hey, Francis, what do you think? I think there are issues that both Republicans and, and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, Mark or myself, can agree upon that are in the best interest of the people in this state. I would suggest that one of those issues would be uh, continued improvement in access to high quality broadband to all reaches of all counties of the state. There's great variation uh, in broadband saturation. I believe that Mark and I would be able to work well to, you know, together on supporting the efforts that are on, in place right now, but also the efforts that have been um, started in the Office of Broadband in Olympia. I, I guess at the, the macro level, I believe that Mark and I have the best interests of the people in the state of the state in mind. I think that there are differences in how we approach um, creating solutions or situations that uh, make things better for people. I believe that the state government has a role in lifting up people when they need help. And so I strongly support the social services, uh, funding public education, and uh, continuing the healthcare authority progress we're making in this state uh, related to Apple Care Cask and Cascade Care, which is hoped to come out uh, in 2021. So, Mark, that answer your question, Jack? Yes. <laughs> well, and I'd like to add on, in a perfect example, I think what Francis and I both agree on is uh, Highway 12, finishing the freeway. Net to me, I need. I look at it as a necessary project. I'm sure she does too, and, and so I we can expand more on on some of the capital expenditure projects, but things like that that are very necessary and needed, we we can agree on those things. So you're both from Walla Walla, Walla Walla area. So how familiar are you with Tri City issues? Because 16th di district that goes like from Waitsbury and Dayton, includes Pasco up to Prosser. Um, and I'm just wondering how, how familiar you are with, with the Tri-City. So I'm gonna let Francis go first on this one. We'll go back and forth a little bit here. Thank you. Uh, as, as most of you know, the legislative districts are created to attempt to uh, have the uh, same amount of uh, citizens, around 135,000. So, I don't know who created the geography of this district. I know that was the intended, that was the intended endpoint, 135-ish people. And I that will evolve as it always does over time. Um, I, growing up in Walla Walla and spending I, living here since 1993, I know Walla Walla County quite well. And I know. Columbia County just because of its proximity and its rural nature quite well. Reaching out to, at the beginning of my campaign, I specifically attempted to reach, reach out to Franklin or Benton County for a campaign manager and campaign support, which I was able to achieve. I have a young, scrappy, uh, smart, uh, woman who works for me who lives in uh, Franklin County. And she has been very helpful in uh, um, bridging some of the, 
the links to from Walla Walla to Franklin and Benton County. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit with many civic leaders in, in um, Pasco. Uh, I've, I've attended and listened to the, um, the Tri-City um, Tri -City Development Council. I think that's the name. They have a coffee with Carl every Friday morning. I have tried to, I have tried to listen to those regularly to understand the issues in Benton and Franklin County. I have regularly attended the Benton and Fr Franklin County Democratic um, Committee meetings, so I can understand the political goings on in the in those in those counties. Uh, and the other thing that I have made a, an attempt to do is understand, um, listen to education leaders in um, Franklin County. Not, not so much Benton County because we don't cover Richland, we cover Prosser um, and uh, public school and also higher education. I've tapped into Columbia Basin College and Heritage and uh, WSU campus, listening to how they're preparing for this, the fall season and the, and, you know, the challenges related to COVID and the challenges around the high, funding higher education going into this new uh, budget cycle. So those are yeah, those are my those have been my efforts to better understand and hear from the people in Franklin and Benton County. Okay. Okay, Mark, your turn. Okay. Yeah. So um, I have spent majority of my life uh, being in Pasco quite often. My grand I, my grandparents, uh, my growing up years, my grandparents lived in in the in Pasco uh, on Opal Street off of 20th Avenue. Uh, they also moved from there to the trailer court, sits underneath the blue bridge that sits there now. Uh, but I also uh, have many friends and people that I, I work with, but I, being with the Washington Farm Bureau for 17 years, I was in the Tri-Cities at least three times a week. I was in Pasco uh, all the time, uh, working on issues uh, all the way as far as Basin City, uh, all the way down into Finley and then into the Horse Heaven Hills. So I work with Benton and uh, Benton County Farm Bureau and Franklin County Farm Bureau. Very important, the issues that they had at hand, everything from labor housing to some of the immigration issues to uh, many of the, the issues that we're dealing with as we know today, primarily uh, the bladder pod uh, labeling from the Depart U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, I, I'm very in tune with w what we're dealing with there and, and some of the issues. One's a perfect example of the infrastructure issue that you were seeing there at the, the Lewis Street Bridge. I think that area there needs to be improved and enhanced. The city of Pasco, downtown Pasco, uh, they need to take a look at some of those issues. And I know that, that those are some of the issues they're, they're, they're looking at to this day. Um, those are necessary projects for the economy of Pasco. Um, it's important. And, and uh, we have to have somebody there that understands it. And, and I understand it. I had, a, I had an asphalt seal coat company and I helped arrange, get uh, their bulk tank into that, uh, uh, used to be Savage Trucking. Um, McGregor bought that out, but it sits there right off the highway, uh, the Clotus Highway. And, uh, and so we made it possible for people to be able to nurse off that, that bulk tank for product. And so I, I'm in there all the time. I get my parts uh, uh, and equipment there in the Tri-City. So I'm, it, it's, part, it's part of my community and it's okay. part of the, the district. How do, um, how do you think the governor has had, oh, did you want some? Okay, Martin, go ahead, go ahead. Martin wants to ask a question. So what do you see as the top two issues, either for the Tri-Cities or for the state? Um, go ahead, Mark. I'll let you answer first this time. Right now, business recovery uh, is, is essential. Uh, it's huge. You guys are still at one, uh, Tri-Cities at 1.5. Um, they can do business and we can do business recovery, but, but um, we've got to be able to, the governor's got to be able to, to, to um, they've got to be able to lift those and, and make it possible for them uh, to do business again. 
and and we can do it by personally protecting and and, uh, and being careful. Uh, so that is that is one of the biggest biggest issues. But we've got to be able to do it, uh, providing tax incentives, maybe business incentives for companies to be able to, that are on the verge of going out of business, but to, to to be able to get back on track, be able to start up and get, and and recover again. And we may be in cost sharing programs or grants, but those are the things I want to be able to do to work with both sides of the aisle to find solutions to help these businesses uh, that they're in dire need of, of help. What about you, Francis? Thank you for that question, Martine. Priority one for me is public health. I, I appreciate that the coronavirus, which is the virus that is ca causes COVID-19 has caused healthcare, a healthcare crisis. And then that has triggered an economic crisis. And we're in the midst of both of them right now. Uh, but quite honestly, my opinion is if we control the virus, the economy will follow. If, if the people are not healthy, the economy will not be healthy. If the people are healthy, the economy will be healthy. The economy is people. And if we don't continue to aggressively contain the spread of the virus by means of the safe start Washington process that's been outlined and you know simply wear a mask have, you know maintain your distance wash your hands and stay home as much as possible that will contain the spread of the virus once we get to the point where we have a vaccine that has been developed and fully vetted and approved through the FDA, then we are going to be faced with another public health challenge and that is getting that vaccine out to everyone. S sort of with, at an overlap time when we're doing the, the flu vaccine. And, and I have participated in several flu vaccine roundups here with Walla Walla County Public Health and St. Mary's partner together. And we distribute, you know, four or 500 doses in a morning um, through, the, through a drive-through section at the hospital. And that is a logistic challenge just to get 500 doses. And now we're looking at this district, 135,000 people, and, you know, just multiply that by how many districts in the state and how many states in this country, that is going to be a challenge, not only for the amount of virus, the maintaining or the, the amount of vaccine, the maintaining of that vaccine in a safe way, the human resources need to do the administration and the logistics of supply chain that is going to be un, in demand for everyone. So that is, in my mind, still looming as the biggest issue that is facing us right now. I understand that the economy has taken a plummet related to having to limit our activity and shut down businesses and shut down the economy. I do believe that there are strategies in, that are strategies that have been identified so that businesses can open up safely, not 100%, but maybe half percent or 50 or 75%. Maybe we look at some variances to the ordinances that are in place in cities so we can be more creative. We've in Walla Walla, I know they have, they have allowed for outdoor seating into the parking areas um, on the streets, which normally wouldn't be the case, but they've done that so that they could increase the uh, capacity at, in their res restaurants. I think those are the kind of innovative things we need to do, but we also need to be mindful of the behavioral modifications that people need to be willing to embrace and embrace for the next eight months, maybe not forever, but for a period of time until we, we can confidently vaccinate for the, the coronavirus. So those are my, those are the two things, Martine, I would say are um, important, but I would, I would reiterate, it has to be in that direction. And it's, it's a, we have to get the health, we have to make the people healthy first. Cecilia? Sure. 
I'd like to ask a question yeah. that I think spins out of the answer we just got. Um, in your legislative district, whichever of you is elected, virtually every one of your hospitals is endangered. And I don't think that's a bit of an exaggeration. Prosser, Pasco, Walla Walla, Dayton, all of them are, as a Republican representative put it to me a couple of years ago, hanging by a thread. And right now they're facing dealing with a pandemic. And on the other hand, we have an administration in Washington that is trying to end Obamacare and has no plan to replace it and could to throw our healthcare system into chaos. So I wanna ask the two of you what you think the state can and should do to try to get us through this, no matter even if that doesn't happen, we are going to be facing tremendous healthcare challenges. And I'd like to know what both of you will be doing, or would be doing if elected in Olympia to make sure that we manage that as well as we possibly can. Go ahead, Mark, I'll let you go first on that. Well, I guess your question is you have, when you say Obamacare, are you asking about uh, actual uh, health care itself or the insurance when it comes to that? Because the Affordable Care Act has to do with, with your insurance. Sure, it has everything to do with, with health care, but when you're, you're talking about your costs and your deductions and, and things of that nature, uh, you're talking when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, um, I personally don't see where uh, that has been um, uh, opportunistic for people uh, that, that uh, want um, inexpensive health care uh, because they're paying, paying high premiums. Uh, I can see that, in the, I see it in the businesses. Um, fortunately, my wife is on, on, a, on a health insurance through the government that helps. Uh, but when it comes to, to uh, health insurance, we have, uh, that has taken away any of the competition in the state of Washington. We do not have an, uh, enough providers. If you could create competition amongst the, uh, the more providers that can pro provide if it is group health care or single health care as well as individual, as well as going across state lines and be able to, to create competition, you're going to have a lot better opportunity example. What I'm, a, I'm scared of, and the question hasn't ever arisen in any of our forums, is, is uh, when you have your Cascadia care, um, that to me is one more step to universal health care. Uh, I talked to a doctor that, that went to a doctor appointment. I won't mention his name. He's from Canada. He said that his mother, now this was two, three weeks ago, but his mother had waited nine months, nine months to get her hip replaced and she's still on the waiting list. Her, his father had a heart attack. This is in Canada. Excuse me, let me back up. This is up in Canada. His father had a heart attack. He was in ICU for two weeks before the cardiologist came to see him. He moved down to the United States because we have better health care. But he's concerned that we're migrating into socialized universal health care. Affordable, affordable health care, the, the Affordable Care Act is one step closer to that. We need to break it down, go back into uh, comp competitive uh, uh, insurance that will help our, our health care industry. Okay, go ahead, Francis. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, from the very macro version of my answer, I'll start there. I, uh, and, and I said this a couple of times, I've been involved in healthcare for 37 years, and I'm very proud of much of what we've done. However, I fully appreciate how confounding, how expensive, how perplexing healthcare is to most people when they're seeking coverage or seeking a provider 
or just seeking out how to figure out how to read their bill that they got from the radiologist. Um, healthcare in this country has become incentivized by profit. And I believe that is immoral to profit on people's illness, their trauma, and their uh, fatigue, essentially. I think we need to turn that system into a system that incentivize, he incentivizes health. And that is an enormous, enormous shift in the way we would approach health care. It is focusing our attention on the social determinants of health. It is preventative care. It is moving way upstream from where problems land now. It is dealing with early on, identifying and dealing with diabetes, not dealing with an amputation. And that's kind of a simple way of describing it, but that will, that is true. It is so important and I think Many health systems are really in, in looking at moving their health care, again, their health care into the community with departments like population health. And again, the social determinants of health. What, what is impacting us in our own environment that is contributing to our pre-existing conditions or creating new conditions? So I think the idea that essentially, you know, pharmaceuticals, insurance companies and medical device manufacturers are profiting off of people's illness needs to change. I, I, my husband has Medicare and for the, for the five, last five years he's been on, that, on, been on Medicare, he could not be happier or better cared for or reimbursed for pre preventative care. That is, you could say, a form of, of universal health care. The idea that we need to just keep incentivizing profit, uh, while I appreciate that profit can um, stimulate innovation at times and creativity in, in the uh, tech, technology side of things, I, I think we, there needs to be a balance and we need to get back, we need to pull this back and not treat the people's diet not, their, not the need for a cardiac stint and then replace that stint in another two years and then replace it again in another two years. Okay, so I heard both of you give me the macro answer, but I didn't hear any, any solutions from either of you on what you think a legislator and the state can do because um, at best, we're going to have to make changes if we're going to preserve our hospitals. That's really where my focus is. And I didn't hear either of you address that. I, I'd like for you to try to do that. I can, I, I can try to do that. I would like particularly to, in our rural hospitals that um, are difficult to recruit and retain providers in those communities. I would like to expand upon telemedicine services. I know Dayton has done just that, that they're providing mental health care services through a telemedicine service through the University of Washington. Um, so innovation and, and improving access by use of telemedicine services. I would advocate for that and for uh, readjusting the, the ability to charge and be reimbursed for those services equal to an in-person visit. I also think that we need to um, provide incentives to our providers so that they would um, commit to a certain, a certain number of years giving providing care in rural areas, uh, maybe tuition, um, tuition in forgiveness, something of that nature. I think the, at the state level through the healthcare authority, we need to expand um, eligibility to Apple Care, so that there are more people who are who can avail themselves of that Medicaid service. And we need to we I mean we need to look at the community hospitals, and we need to recognize that they need our support. 
they're simply not being, they're simply not able to maintain their services with the reimbursement they're receiving at this time. Uh, and so we have to do something about either the, the reimbursement or the expenses for the institution to stay open. Uh, that would be, though, that would be my answer. Isn't one of the, isn't one of the problems though that um, you're talking about them staying open and being busy enough, but that competition is coming from within the industry with so many of the specialists opening their clinics and funneling away all the patients who make for who, who actually pay for the hospital's operation. Uh, yes, that 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 contributes to the that contributes to the problem. I don't know if that is mu as much of a concern in more rural areas than it is in urban areas. Um, I know in Seattle there, you know, there's, you can go through, get, go to any, a number of drive through GI services, you know, where you can have a colonoscopy or other procedure that what used to be done, all being done in the hospital, but now people have become, um, have opted to create sort of for-profit and they don't have to take call in the emergency room. And it's a, it's perhaps a, it's a different lifestyle for them. And I don't know how to say, I'm not sure we, I don't know how we could say that can't happen. I think we need to let Mark have a turn here. So yeah. go, go ahead, Mark. Well, and that is, and, 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 and Francis does have some good ideas and the things to talk about the telemedicine. Um, I, I'm, I'm the type of person that loves, to, I, I want everybody to be, to participate your, your public private partnerships, things of that nature. Well, what we're up against in these rural hospitals, rural clinics is just exactly what you said. Majority of the specialists are, are in into the cities now. And so, you know, I have to go up uh, to, my wife has to go up and to Spokane for some tests. So it's all up in that area that they don't do even in Walla Walla uh, and definitely not Dayton or any of those, those small communities. Um, but we, I'm a firm believer we have to keep these hospitals open uh, uh, at least uh, at a minimum to be able to care for the for the people that are, that are ill. Uh, number one, it, it, it uh, keeps it from having to fill up some of these other bigger hospitals. But I'm, a, I, I'm an incentive type person. I believe everybody needs to have some grit into it. And so I believe if, uh, as like Dayton is constantly having a bond issue, I think this is the opportunity Instead of some of the your, your pork barrel spending and some of these different things that, that we do in Olympia, um, do some matching funds that will help these hospitals out, bring that money in uh, with a percentage of matching funds whenever they have the bond issues. That will help keep them keep them going. Um, so many of our, our nurses and medical teams uh, are really underpaid. Uh, because they're just they're hanging by a shoestring, so I'm I believe that that would be a, a good way of helping some of these hospitals uh, with bond issues and and get some matching funds coming in uh, and allocating that for for some of those hospitals. I have one other thought on that. Could I sure chat sure. it? I I know that there are um, I, I don't know if. Prosser Hospital, Memorial Hospital is a critical access hospital. I believe, I believe Dayton is. And that's a designation made by the state um, related to their location. It's a critical access hospital. It's a certain amount of miles away from another hospital. And reimbursement for those to those hospitals is adjusted to account for their um, the uh, the critical nature of their being of their presence in a community, understanding that they're not going to have the volume that normally you would expect to keep a hospital um, profitable. And I think that's a kind of thing that that the state department, the state government, the state legislature could continue to look at and adjust reimbursement rates to those hospitals that meet that designation. I believe both Lords and Prosser. Oh, Lords too. Critical access hospitals. I believe that's correct. It's, it's not. It's not just mileage. It's, it's 
county yes. lines and things like that. Yeah, it, there's it's a number so of... It's ridiculous that Pasco has critical access, and they're just five miles away from Kenwick and from Richmond. <laughs> I don't so, disagree with that. I didn't realize Lourdes was a critical access hospital. Yeah. Limited to, I think, 29 beds. Mm -hmm. I think the hospital in Hermiston is, and the hospital in Pendleton is. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask about uh, your thoughts on the governor's response to COVID. Um, uh, I know in Franklin County, there's a, a group of um, Republicans that they want to defy the governor. They think um, it's gone too far with his um, shutting down the, the businesses. And um, I'd like to know, Mark, where you land on that. Well, and uh, Francis as well, but I'm going to have Mark answer first. Uh, we, the governor has, has uh, pretty much established himself that he's not going to, he, he's going to call the shots. And without assessing what we're doing uh, with our legislatures, we, a uh, number of legislatures I've talked legislators I've talked to have tried to talk to him, and he he's unwilling to visit with them about it. Um, the majority party, both both houses, and then the governor uh, refused to have any type of special session to discuss it. He's 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 calling from his office, um, so he's the one that that has the control of that. Um, there, and it's very unfortunate. That, that the Tri Cities isn't as open as is uh, is the rest of the communities uh, around us, and and um, uh, so I believe that that he needs to work with both houses uh, and and both sides of the aisle uh, and and to come up with a solution and and get some of their input. But he refuses to talk to to the legislators uh, that I know of, at least the Republicans. What about you, Francis? I uh, I have been I have not I have not experienced a healthcare crisis quite like this in my thirty seven years, and I think that uh, I think in general I would give Governor Inslee and the Department of Health a B in their response to the COVID um, pandemic. I understand that what we knew about the coronavirus in January is different than what we knew in March, is what is different than what we knew at, at the uh, end of June when the mandatory mask requirement came into place. That is the nature of a sci the scientific process is that you have a problem and you, you evaluate it and you see if the mitigating steps you took have change the outcome and then you readjust your plan and you readjust your steps and you see if that makes, and the more you know, the better you do. And the more you know, now we know so much more than we did in the middle of June. And I believe that, uh, I'm going to believe that it was in the best intention of the people of the state that there was perhaps over adjustment in limiting some uh, businesses related to construction, outdoor construction. I believe that was, that was changed within a month or so of the initial decision. Um, and, I, and I know those kinds of um, steps impacted our economy greatly. I also think we, you know, <laughs> From county to county to county, how we deal with this is fine if people just stay in their own county. But this is a very mobile, uh, as, you know, society at this point. And where are the hot spots still in our state? If you go to the COVID dashboard from you know Washington.gov, you can see the hot spots are Spokane, Benton, Franklin, Yakima, Snohomish, Pierce, and King. And, but then there's plenty of, um, there's plenty of outbreaks in other parts of the state. And I think we could have done, we could have done better to implement mass, mandatory masking sooner. Mm -hmm. I think that was, I think that that made all the difference in the world in Yakima County to flatten their curve and head them in the right direction. 
I believe that Governor Inslee, hmm, I always think you can do a better job with communicating because a good idea and a plan is only as effective as the, the communication plan attached to it when you're talking about 7.6 million people. Uh, and I think there has to be, at the end of all of this, we need to do a real thorough review on what we thought we were doing, how did that turn out, and what lessons have we learned so that when the next coronavirus comes along or whatever pandemic comes along, we will be able to work more effectively from the CDC and the NIH and the national big guys, big women there that are smarter ones in the room to the state department of health, from the state department of health to the county level. And that is a two way communication street um, that can only be made better, I would hope through this experience. Can I say one, sure. one more thing on that? Sure. The, the part that's very frustrating, discouraging to me is that the governor is going to shut down wedding venues and church services and things of that nature or very much limit, limit them. But at the same time, it uh, doesn't lift a finger when it comes to the protests in, in all the cities throughout the state of Washington. And I just saw in the, the Wawa Union Bulletin a picture in the paper yesterday where people, you know, they weren't six foot apart, they were assembled, uh, but yet we don't hear anything from him on that. But yet when it comes to uh, other gatherings, you know, the requirement of the health departments to shut anything down. And so, to me, it's, it's kind of hypocritical that, that uh, businesses can't operate. Some of these things, are, you know, they're, they're not opening things up, but at the same time, they're allowing, uh, you know, large, huge protests uh, uh, throughout Seattle and, and uh, you see in Olympia and every, you know, places like that. So, so to me, uh, uh, I think that the governor has not done a good job whatsoever. And I, I really believe that, that, uh, he needs to work with both sides of the aisle in the legislature. Are there any other questions from the board, Ken or Jack? Or Sorry, I'd, like, I'd like to ask uh, Francis, you know, you're, you seem a very practical person, but you're facing a very practical problem. Uh, you've got, you're trailing it by about 13,000 votes. You've got 33%. How come you haven't thrown in the towel? Oh, because I... <laughs> because I wouldn't do that because I have too many people that are supporting me and uh, actively working on this campaign. And I went into this understanding exactly where I live and who has represented this district for decades. And I think that I am a candidate who can speak to anybody about any issue and I have readjusted a little bit of how we plan to reach voters in the last two months. And we're making thousands of phone calls and we are going to push on to November. It's not in my nature to throw in the towel. Okay, well, I think I had... Um... It, it, I'm going to respond to that. If, sure, sure, um, go ahead. You know, hats off to Francis as well. I, I think it's, you know, that's, that's part of our, our, uh, our duty as Americans to do that. And, and, uh, and by not throwing in the towel, I, I hand it to her because it, um, she's a good person and, and what she's trying to do is... is Pretty patriotic, so I I hand. I'm certainly not suggesting she should. <laughs> there must be a big incentive to do that. So um, I had uh, told Mark and Francis that uh, we'd give them a chance to ask each other a question if they wanted to do that. So Mark is smiling. Do you have a question for Francis? Oh, no, I don't. You I don't. don't. Okay. All right, Francis. Do you have a question for Mark at all, or? I do. I, get, I, I heard that from Ansley today, and I do, I, uh, I do have a question. I've heard since, our, since you jumped into this uh, campaign, Mark, you have said, or I've heard you say, and I'm paraphrasing, the culture and customs of 
I don't know, the east part of the state or this particular district or rural America are being degraded or being under attack. And I would like to know how you define customs and cultures and by whom are they under attack? Sure, that's a great question. Yeah. Under the National sure. Environmental Policy Act, Force Practices Act, uh, and those are national acts. But our customs and culture are what define us, that defines what we do every single day. So it's our custom, we're out there, we're, we're raising wheat, growing wine. Uh, we have our different uh, businesses that are, are going back that is, is what our customs are, but the, also the culture defines that as well. We are different. Our customs and culture in the Eastern Washington is, is so much different than what you're gonna find in Seattle and Olympia and Bellingham. And so what we are up against primarily, you'll find things in the Growth Management Act, how zoning is done compared to what is done over in, in Seattle. The things they can get away with and they do because they are not regulated like we are. We're forced into, to, um, and the Growth Management Act, we're forced into cluster, cluster housing, and but then they leave the rest of it uh, unbuildable properties because that's the way the, the Growth Management Hearing Board want to see it. So those are the things that are being attacked, uh, uh, you know, regarding our custom and our culture. And you got to throw in our economic stability, which is our tax base. And so that's how I define it. That's what's so important. Okay, yeah. And, and, and so, so Cecilia, you were asking me, I was laughing, but do I have a question? Is that what you're wanting to know? Sure, if you wanted to ask Francis a question. Okay, yeah, when you said I was laughing, I didn't know. Well, you had a smile on your face. So I thought maybe yeah. there was one on your in your mind, so, but. But put, put aside, uh, Francis, my question for you, putting aside, uh, putting our, our health needs in order, what would your solution be to business recovery after this pandemic, say it's over within the next month or two? What, are, what would your solution be? I think that given the fact that the revenues side of everybody's budget is, uh, is weak right now, whether it be the, the county, the city, the state, federal, we're all challenged with not enough revenue related to COVID. Uh, my responsibility as a legislator would be to listen to local municipalities, listen to the ports, understand what they, how they identify their needs. And then I would, I would understand what revenue sources there are available. Um, I, I know that there are uh, there's funding through the curb um, uh, organization, or that's not the right word, the, cur the curb uh, group for economic development through the ports. I would continue to investigate those thoroughly and find out what, what, what funds are available. And then I would go back to the government and see what, you know, what the budget, budgets are for the different departments that would sponsor those kinds of either capital infrastructure needs or development needs. I would, I would advocate for the small business, um, uh, sm small business uh, recovery through the state. And then I would work with the USDA and the um, other federal organizations for the CARES to funding that we hope will come through. Um, but at the end of the day, I would I would really want to understand from the ground up what the needs are. I don't pretend to know. And I don't know the solutions that the people that are doing the work can come up with unless you ask. So Great. that's what I would do. Great. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to the end here. So we should give you your Two minutes to wrap up. Um, let's see, Francis went first for the opening. So I guess Mark will let you go first with the uh, um, uh, with the closing. So whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, it's really essential that we get our economy back in order. 
We're at the latest figure was four and a half billion dollar shortfall. We thought it was going to be about a nine billion dollar shortfall, but the latest the latest numbers were about four and a half billion. That's four and a half billion, and uh, it's really important that we find solutions, uh, and we can't tax our way out of this. Businesses are leaving our state, uh, not like California, but they're le leaving our state. Our gas tax is. You know, astronomically high. Uh, you know, right now our gas prices should be below two dollars a gallon, but we do have to to tax to, to maintain our roads and things of that nature. But unfortunately, we're they're putting taxes on the employers and employees that that are well over a dozen taxes nationally and statewide uh, that that we're currently taxing, and they're looking at implementing more tax. I have ideas of being able to work in the legislature, it be a freshman legislature, to work uh, with both sides of the aisle to find solutions for number one, business recovery, finding ways of, of creating tax incentives, grant money, cost sharing programs to help our, our businesses that are really struggling and, and help other businesses get started. That's really my main focus uh, on this. At the same time, working on opportunities to uh, make it possible to uh, not necessarily increase regulations, but slow down regulations that are affecting us throughout the state. And so that is uh, the, the main, my main objective. And that's why I look forward to going to Olympia and working with, with uh, the people to find some solutions. That was perfect. As far as time goes, thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was just perfect. <laughs> okay, so whenever you're ready, Francis, go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Tri City Herald and the community members for this opportunity. Thanks, Mark, for being here and engaging in lively conversation. In Olympia, I will approach an issue with concern and curiosity. I do not know all the answers and one size doesn't fit all. I will work hard to remain open, to hear my colleagues and listen to stakeholders and opposing ideas. As your legislator, I will strive to craft law that is in the people's best interest to make things better, safer, healthier, more equitable. I will work with anyone to solve a problem and I will not belittle belittle anyone for opposing ideas. No slogans, just a lot of hard work. Government derives its legitimacy from the people to whom it must be governable, must be answerable. No one should be left behind. Um, I'm Frances Quaddle, and if you'd like more information about my campaign, see www.electfrancis.com. And I'm looking forward to November Remember to wear a mask and vote. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. It was this is this was really lovely. Thank you very much. This Thank was you. Good conversation. A lot of a lot of important issues. So, so I am. Um, I'm going to ask our board to hang on for a few minutes, but we'll say goodbye to Mark and Francis. And um, it was Thank really you, great. To, Thanks was, for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great to meet you. Goodbye. Even though Bye. Zoom. <laughs> so thank you.